I know you as an artist and um, you are an artist in every sense, um, but an element of your work um, is also to produce things that are wearable. Does, does it change the meaning um, when, you know, something, something is obviously in a display case um, or on a table um, f- placed there for the sake of contemplation in its autonomous um, isolation from everything else on a platform that's sort of platonic yeah. as opposed to something which is, I guess, um, by virtue of being attached, um, decorative or, um, you know, a part of, a part of your sort of uh, persona as the wearer. Um, and given that obviously the subject matter is, is you know, yeah. it's philosophically um, delicate, I, I'm just wondering how it travels. So that fascinates me. Well, it's quite, it's, the wearability is quite an interesting point for me for a few reasons because it changes the ultimate end result of the piece, obviously, because there's got to be that functionality. So you're generally dealing with one side of something or the best side of it, putting a brooch onto it, that kind of thing. Whereas when I'm making an object, it's 100% pure and it's aesthetic because mm-hmm. there's no compromising to do that. But sometimes that compromise can be interesting. Um, there's also again the talismanic yeah. kind of amuletic property when you're wearing something again having that energy of an animal against you and then the third thing with it is the perception that people have like it freaks a lot of people yes, out yes. and you know I can go down the street wearing a dead mouse pin to my lapel I get people telling me it's cruel it's yes. disgusting yes. it's this it's that it's like they're wearing leather shoes. They're wearing a yes, cow yes, wrapped yes, around their feet. Yes. It, and it's, it's completely hypocritical. There's almost the assumption that if, if you're wearing it, it's your kill. Yeah. Um, but we don't assume this with any other animal product that we which use. Which, on the contrary, yeah. you have killed by yeah. virtue of buying the meat. Yeah, and supp- yeah, supplying or giving you, an income to the people. Yes, to, you're, you're yeah. complicit in the death of the beast. Yeah. But there's that diso- disassociation that goes on now where... If a lot of people had to kill their own meat, they wouldn't eat it. Yes. But they don't have to see what goes on. And what goes on is probably a lot more horrific than in the days when people did kill, yes. rear and kill yes. their own meat. And, you know, one of the reasons I'm a vegetarian, I couldn't do it. So, mm. Mm. and I just definitely, I definitely couldn't kill anything for my work. And I have had a bit of hate mail from a few generally young people who have their, hearts, yeah, yes. have their hearts in the right place, just don't really research things. They see yes. my work, straight away find my email and send me a very abusive, badly spelt, badly punctuated, mm. you know, with your spelt you are. And yes, I, I, I get a few of those That too. kind of thing. Yes. And, and it's always a bit entertaining, but I always send them back a very nice email just same saying, here. you know, I really appreciate mm. where you're coming from. I have the same beliefs, yep. but maybe you should, should research me. I support these animal rights causes. I'm a vegetarian. You know, these are the things I do to mm. make this happen. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing bad things. And I normally give them a list of people they can write letters to mm. who deserve them uh, systematically um yes yeah bringing death to peace yeah. yes yes i'm intrigued how we see nature because we can be vegetarian but sure as hell a lot of other creatures aren't and yeah including the ones that we you know keep as pets yeah. um who 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 whom i suppose we feed with meat um i i i, I um I know that dogs are omnivorous. They will yeah. eat absolutely yeah. anything. Um, um, so, you know, you, you, you can keep a dog going on almost, it seems to me, almost anything, even though they like me yeah. most of all, um, and they're built for it, I guess. Um, but um, when we look at the rest of nature and how it, it is, um, well, as you say, programmed by instinct, yeah. and that instinct is um, to kill um, the um, it 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 places an interesting. Uh, I mean, do you ever um, sense a difference if you're handling a carnivore in your work as opposed to a herbivore? Oh, I definitely, in terms of 
a physical difference, especially when it comes to domestic animals. Any, most, I guess most um, animals that have come, like birds and deer and stuff like that, are all very lean. Mm. But you get a domestic cat and it's just layers and layers of fat that you're getting through, which is, you know, very representative of them eating a not natural diet because they're eating, uh, you know, canned cat food and probably uh, too much of it and it's cooked meat and it's like when in the wild would a cat be eating cooked meat? Um, <laughs> so I find that interesting and with my dogs I have definitely struggled with that as well and the solution I've come to is I've found a biodynamic chicken farm. So they're the chickens that are reared in the most humane and natural way and I just get the off cut so mm. I buy the bones and the necks and yeah. things like that but again there wouldn't be a supply of that if no, no, there weren't no, people yeah, eating yeah. meat so it's yeah. still not a purely ethical source and then I feed them vegetables mm. and stuff like that yeah they'll well. eat almost oh, anything won't yeah, they yes yeah. uh, keep well they're themselves. just scavengers so. yes exactly yeah um but yeah it's, it's very interesting and you know you see a lot of overweight pets because people don't feed them properly yes. and I try to feed my dogs a diet that they would be eating in the wild or something mm. similar mm. to that um so you know they and I, I take them walking and they eat a lot and they're very healthy and people come up to me and tell me that my dogs are skinny and I'm not feeding them and but that's also because they're pruned they have nice um oh, nice they're, haircut they're hairless yeah it's a hairless dog they're hairless. So, yeah. yeah um but it is, it is funny because people are quite used to seeing, you know, the fat Labrador. But I, I can assure you when you cut into a, a Labrador like that, it's not, a, it's it's not, not a, natural. Not, it's, it's not a nice yeah, size. Because most animals don't have a lot of fat yeah. on them. And when they live in the wild, the food supply is scarce and they're eating a natural diet that sustains them. Yes, yes. You said before that a lot of people think that your work is um, grotesque. And um, and I, I'm sure that you you know I mean I'm not talking here about the hate mail, but if yeah. someone is someone wearing one of your pieces, um, uh, I think uh, is sure to encounter some yeah. you know is, is is are you morbid yeah you know um, so I mean is is there an element of um, that, that you know. It, it, you know, we, we we have a kind of pact in society that there are certain things we won't look at, there are certain things we won't bother to um, bother to um, inquire about, um, and um, and that you you um, are in defiance of that. You know that your 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 you know part of your making activity is actually um, soliciting thought on this. Yeah. Well, I. I love posing the questions, you know, like the I'm wearing a mouse and you think that's weird, but you're wearing a cow on your foot. It's just people yeah, don't yeah, really yeah. think about no. it. People are quite happy to go through life without thinking about the things that they do. And I guess I've kind of made it a big focus of my life to really think about every aspect of what I do and what its impact is yes. and how it affects me and other people. And it, it, it's quite a confronting thing to do and it makes my life very difficult yes because if you try to live ethically you find that you actually have to work a lot harder than yes the average person yes but but on the, so. oh, 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 oh yes I agree I agree um and I mean any any form of resistance is hard work yeah. Um, but 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 the nice thing is it's highly storyable. <laughs> I yeah. use this word, you know, like I, it, there's a story in it, and yeah. and it seems to me that um, you know that that's a part of what we do as art, art, artists. I mean, uh, that the world is a lot more interesting than it's taken to be. Yeah. And um, and so uh, you know when you, when you when you make something that kind of um, resists the or, or um, it stands in some defiance of uh, of, of taste. Yeah. I mean, it is taste, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, taste and conditioning, yes. I guess. I, I, I always just imagine that that, um, that people think you're, you're naughty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, yeah, unusual. And a lot of people, when, unusual, they, when, they, when they meet me for something like this, I often, especially younger people, and if they haven't really seen interviews with me or other things before, 
a kind of like, oh, we thought you'd be a goth. Like, I think they're expecting yes, me with my like, yes, long yes. black Morticia hair and lots of jewellery and black nails and black mm. lipstick and quite morbid. Scary, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of what I work in. But mm. again, for me, it's not about that. It's like, it's about death, but it's about yes. life. And I don't really try and separate the two. Yes, yes. Because, there's, you know, they're separated on a timeline. Yes. But they're all part of the same thing. And it's a bit cliche to say, you know, you can't have one without the other, but it, everything's cyclical like that. And there's yes. this kind of quest for immortality or the uh, the concept of not dying or people not wanting to die or prolonging it and the whole <laughs> euthanasia argument yes. and all of that kind of thing. It's kind of like it's, I guess for me, life is about quality of life and while you have it. Yes, certainly. Death... Um is so fascinating because it's an end which in, in, in our terms uh, can't be considered an end as in a goal. Yeah. Um, because it's the absence of your goals, it's when your goals no longer, in a sense, they've become um, redundant. Yeah. Um, so it's an end, it's a very special end in that sense. It's a, um, and, and, and possibly an end that other other cultures haven't, uh, you know, it's, it's like our ancestry in terms of, you know, uh, especially any any um, any kind of Christian uh, yeah. value system has really no um, will to countenance because it's as we were saying before a gateway to to another to another existence, um, but um, the idea of um, that finality. Um, that it is in fact the the end of um, one's ends, you know, one's goals, one the scope of life. Um, is that something that um, can usefully be handled in art? I mean, is that something that we can lighten up over or become profound about, or is it is it literally a dead end? I mean, um, that. You know, can we, is there wisdom in thinking about death? Well, I, I believe there is. Like, I think it's it's definitely got that A, because it is that finality, you can use it as inspiration. It's like, you know, I think if, if we were sure that you'd be born again and you'd get another shot, people might be a bit less likely to put any effort in or you know do these things but it's kind of like this punctuation to your life it's like what have I done what am by the time if I die now what have I achieved if I die in 30 years what have I achieved um but it's also for me as I said before I don't really believe it's the end I don't know what I believe comes after it but I believe mm. in spirits and energy mm. and that kind of thing so I don't think the light can just go out and maybe you won't exist as you do now and your thoughts may not be the same but I believe there's still something that goes and I just believe in the very cyclical nature of life um so I think it is an I think it's something that people have been philosophizing philosophizing yes and and, and and the way we're married to nature I mean, you were alluding to that before about the way life uh, and to be fair, this is something that, you know, like liberation theologists have also said that, uh, you know, um, all, um, uh, all living creatures have the same value. Um, and um, it, it, it's uh, salutary, I guess, to think of nature in some way as being a something greater that we belong to and that yeah. we in sense um you know we've created something and you know that, that though transiting and inevitably that means that we're not going to remain yeah um it, it's it's part of something marvelous yeah. um and that in in that sense um a kind of atheist cosmology takes care of our prospect of death it's an interesting thing I could talk about. Yes, I mean, I, I, art, art prompts it. It doesn't yeah. answer anything, yeah. and, and I don't think we need to have answers. It's always struck me that, um, um, oh, I, um, uh, I think um, <laughs> so, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten my source, but someone witty like Bernard Shaw who said, you know, there are, 
there are um, there are answers to to uh, there are every uh, complicated question um, has a simple answer, and it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's almost you know every answer kind of just draws more questions yeah, really, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. As well, it's it's um, yeah. For me, I just kind of go on. I'm more and more so intuition and feelings and I don't really have well, I have a bit of evidence to back up my beliefs and my feelings about life and death but it, yeah it really is just intuition based and just kind of like a knowledge and what yeah how I feel about these yes, things and yes I guess you know from spending a lot of time around animals and in nature definitely having that feeling that they have souls too and they've got you know my two dogs have both had the exact same upbringing and one of them is terrified nervous anxious meek little thing and the other one's this boisterous outgoing that was the one that was playing with me yeah Yeah. and so it's kind of like you know whenever you get to know an animal it has a personality just like a human does yes they totally do yes yes they really do and they have a sense of humor which is almost impossible to describe or well define. at the for um the panel that i was on the other week one of the artists was saying that they've just discovered that rats laugh really and that you can tickle them and they do this high pitch laughing noise which can only be detected with because it's out of our hearing range um and if you do it every day to them they start to like it and they'll come and roll over and expose their ticklish spot and they're also saying that the rats that laugh the most are the most popular in the social groups mm. so you know, there's these very human traits that we sometimes maybe project onto animals, like the way that we think dogs are smiling, but it's just the way yes, they're their panting. mouth is held. But, yes. this, is, but yes. this is actually a very human quality. Yes, that we you induce... don't really think of animals as laughing, but this, no. this is something that they're now discovering. That they actually do. Yeah, they actually yes, do. Yes, they actually and... do. Yes, yes. So I, I must say, uh, uh, I. I, I um, extreme, you know, we have this sympathy, this sympathy for animals um, that um, invites us to induce all our properties upon them. Yeah. Which is, I guess, you know, both not unscientific but uh, endearing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but sadly, that doesn't always extend to compassion. Yeah. Um, which humans admittedly lack for one another yeah. as well. Oh, definitely. Um, so. But it's interesting, you know, also when you start going into domestic animals versus wild animals, like when I did my kitten trophy rug, which is at Mona now, the response to that piece, that was the first domesticated animal I think I'd ever done. And it was at first shown at the NGV and the Sicily and Colin Rig Award. Yes. And I just went down there one day and stood by my cabinet to see how people were responding because people generally are pretty positive about my work to my face, but this was more the general public who oh, were yes. walking through a you know quite a popular gallery and not really expecting to encounter this kind of thing. And there were these women there saying, oh, it's absolutely terrible, it's horrible, look at its horrible little face, it's so cruel and, mm-hmm. you know, all of that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But a deer or the white, you know, and it's it's when yeah, you start using puppies yeah. and kittens, That's people right. do feel that connection. The sentimentality, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think they can start to put themselves in the position of how they would feel if it was their cat or their dog, whereas if it's a bird that was on the side of the road, people don't really have that same sympathy no, no, for it. No, no. But imagine, imagine the thought of going out looking for a dog to bump off, I mean, <laughs> to stick it on your wall. Yes, yeah. it's not. Uh, it's not a particular. It's not. It's not going to be the process that an artist is going to choose no. in the <laughs> um, in the uh, in the art for the for, well, for the, some. Yes, there was a. I can't remember where she's from. I think somewhere in Europe. This woman who was breeding mice. And then chopping them in half while they were alive and sticking them on her fingers like finger puppets and taking photos. And, of course, she had Peter and the RSPCA and stuff. And I think I can only imagine it was the shock for her that, you know, it was what was driving her was, you know, that response. Yes, yes. That kind of thing. Yes, uh, that's a pretty bracing concept. There there have been been, um, uh, acts of cruelty uh, to the, animals. The guy who tied the dog up yes, in the gallery. Yes, right, to starve the dog. Days. Yes. Um, so, yeah. It is. Yes. 
And you, yes, but you would you would hope that people would be able to distinguish yeah. um, something that is um, that is actually cruel to animals yeah. and something which is which is um, in fact um, um, creating a very dignified yeah. term for them. Well, I feel like now that I've had enough press and I'm quite vocal about everything, and most mm. people seem to know what my stance is. And it's always been a fairly positive response, you know. There's it's been there's been little periods of a few people who haven't done their research mm. getting upset, or people that are just seeing it in a gallery and don't know anything about mm. it. Um, but it doesn't take much explanation to curb that, and mm. generally it can go in the direction of a pretty positive conversation with the outcome of the person saying, "I wouldn't wear that, but I can appreciate it." You know, or it's not for me, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. can see where you're coming that, from. That they don't have to deliver themselves of a polemic against yeah. the concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then it is art and yeah. people like to do that. Yeah, and, yeah oh, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and I guess that's the thing, you know, if, if it's generating thought and discussion, it's doing its job. I, I, I agree, so. I agree, yes. It's not for us to police that. We yeah. can only say what, what, what is in our mind. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I've loved talking. Oh, it's been really yeah. good. It was nice. I wish all interviews could be like Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks oh, so, so much, welcome. Julia. Thank you. Thank you.